Hello, Park City's Baptist Church. I'm so thankful to be here today. My name is Cynthia Ganoff, and I have been at Park City's for many, many years, raised kids here, was married in this church, and my mom and dad, Tom and Dorothy Wilkinson, are also very active here. And so it's just a great privilege to get to come today and to chat with a very good friend of mine, Amy Weedy, who is married to Lloyd, has three adult children and 11 grandchildren and has served our church so well for so many years, especially with the youngest of these, the little ones. And I know that firsthand, Amy, because you have actually taught two of my three little ones. So welcome and we're glad you're here. Thank you so much. You know, it's, I forgot, I, particularly Brett, who's now what, eight? He's 14. Yes, I taught that sweet boy. You did, you did. And so I'm just thankful that we get to come today and chat with you just about your life and church and teaching others and discipleship. And there's so much that you have to add. And so just uh, hoping and praying that I get out of the way and we get the privilege of hearing from you. And so let's just start by talking about your kids. And I was thinking okay. this morning of that verse in 3 John 1, 4, no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in truth. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on seeing your kids now as they follow the Lord and what that looks like. Uh, you know, Cynthia, isn't that the truth? My kids are now um, old. <laughs> they are 30, I think 37, 40, and almost 42. And so m my kids are adults, and, and there is nothing greater than to see them walking with the Lord and see how they raise their family. You know, when they were little, you, you, you think you're grounding them, and you think you're doing the right thing, but honestly, you don't know. Yeah. And it's, it's being grounded in the Lord to trust that He will do that work in their mm -hmm. hearts. And so to see that their life is not necessarily going to pattern. Yeah. How I, you know, how I raise my kids is not, they're not necessarily, necessarily going to do that same thing right. with their children. Right. And so I, I, I've seen this in my own life with my mom and dad. You know, I've always heard that you never really stop parenting your kids. And I think most people can probably relate to that. And um, as a child of my parents, I still go to my parents with so many questions. But I'm curious, what does it look like for you with adult children continuing to disciple them and to kind of walk the road with them now in life? Well, I have to tell you, first off, uh, Cynthia and I had kind of, she had sent me an email of things that she was going to be talking about. <laughs> And when I showed it to my husband, he said, disciplining? What? Wait, how are you still disciplining your children? <laughs> Was there a typo? I said, Lloyd, no, it is discipling, discipling yes. your children. And I, you know, I've really had to think on that, Cynthia, because right or wrong, it's more still continuing to live out that life of serving, of uh what I've done before of not retiring yeah. from, you know, so many people, and you hear it so often, I just heard it from David Jeremiah talk about, you know, people get to a certain age and it's, oh, it's time to retire. Well, it's never, I think yeah. Billy Graham said, you don't hear retire in the Bible. So I think it's continuing to live out that life of service that is, I hope, I think, a good discipleship right. to my children. Well, and I think that as, as in raising small kids and all the way through, it's so more evident in how you live. We learn so much more by how someone lives than what they say. Mm -hmm. The words uh -huh. end up not always being as significant. <laughs> and so I, I love what you're saying is continuing to model it, doing the things that you're about and just showing your kids that. And so let's talk grandkids. 11? We have 11 grandkids. What's the age span? They range from our two oldest are twin girls. They're, they just turned 15. And that really makes me feel old. <laughs> and then our youngest is um, one year old. Oh. And so I, oh gosh, if you ask me how many girls were girl heavy, I think we have four boys, I believe. Yeah. And um, t four of them live with their mom and dad up in Connecticut, up in the Northeast. Um, the other two are my two sons. I mean, the other two, my two sons, and they live locally and they 
comprise the rest, so seven kids here locally. You got, a, you got a lot of action in your life with all the grandkids. We have a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. And we love it. Yeah. We love it. And so I think probably a lot of people can listen to this and relate, but in those places where you're watching your kids raise kids and you're thinking, ooh, don't do that, or oh, that's a misstep, or maybe you're seeing what you think or perceive could be some mistakes in it. How, how do you guide your kids and your grandkids well, but also bite your tongue when necessary? What's that balance? Oh, I don't know if I, you know, I think I can tell you more things I don't do well than what I do well. Right, I me mean, too. we're all trial and error, and once again, grounding in our faith and grounding in prayer. But um, <laughs> I think under my breath, I'll just be saying, oh, I don't know if they need to be having that many soft drinks or, you know, that kind of stuff. But what I love is that they allow us to discipline their children as far as if they're with us and the kids are unkind to somebody or if they say something that's not appropriate. Um, all three of my kids and their spouses are so sweet yeah. and generous to allow me to do that because mm -hmm. I don't want my grandchildren growing up without that structure. And I think they have great structure in their homes. But I think also I, I'm one of those that takes a village to mm -hmm. raise children. And I don't think it's only my grandchildren. I think it's, you know, all children. How can we come alongside the parents? Mm -hmm. Or how can we come alongside our friends who are parenting and just be a part of that? So yeah, yeah, it's a fine balance, but... Um, I just trust that the Lord guides um, yeah. in the things we say and the things we do with our grown children. Well, I love that whole concept of just balancing it and, and being their friend and their grandparent and having fun with them because you don't have to parent this round as much, but also having the freedom to be able to step in and care about the things that are significant and matter and speaking into that. I'm thinking of an example in my own life. I have a 14-year-old son and, you know, the teenage boys, we love you, but my goodness, <laughs> they're not the best communicators in the world. But he said something last night. He has his last football game and he said, will you make sure that my grandparents come to my last game? And just how... Even then, in those places, it's significant. It's making a difference. When it feels like they don't care or they're not interested or that you've timed out or you're too old or whatever that is, that's not the case. That they care. And when you start feeding into these kids, it's significant. And so I would love for you to tell people, how have you balanced that? And I could be making this up, but I believe you do like a grandparent camp or something like that. But what are ways that you've taken opportunities to have fun with them, yet also do a little bit of the same discipling type idea? Um, that's another thing that you had, had mentioned in your email. And Lloyd said, well, I think we have grandparent camp every week because <laughs> from the time that our daughter's uh, kids were little, I've kept them on various occasions most every week. And then I've been able to take them to vacation Bible school with me mm -hmm. because I love to teach vacation Bible school. Um, I've taken many of them. I'm in Bible study fellowship. I'm the children's supervisor. Wow. And so I've been able to bring so many of my grandkids with me. And that time in the car, mm -hmm. that just living life is just so wonderful. Yeah. Because we can leave vacation Bible school or we can leave Bible study and talk about what we learned, the songs we sang. Oh, the songs are just wonderful to come back. I've, I've downloaded so many of those songs yeah. that we can just have playing in my car from time to time. But then other times I pull up my old 70s songs and, <laughs> you know, the kids yes. love that. And, and Yaya kind of likes to drive fast sometimes. And Yaya. They, <laughs> they love kind of going fast with Yaya. But we, we love to bake together. We love to... Um, I'm a Star Wars fan and an Avengers Marvel fan, so... We love those movies together. Yeah. And it's just so great. I just love kids. Mm -hmm. I love, they're so much more fun than adults, honestly. <laughs> I great. love just watching them grow. I love seeing these little personalities that God has created exactly as they are. My son was... My youngest son, Grant, was a strong-willed child. And it turns out he needed that. When he 
he and his wife had their first child, Hazel, mm -hmm. who has chromosome deletions, and that that's a multitude of things that they've had happen, surgeries and so much. That's what he needed to be. Mm -hmm. That's how God used him mm -hmm. to parent this little girl and to be able to share his faith through her journey. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And I think there's these places in parenting, and, and you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with that, that as, as, as I'm parenting, even a preschooler right now, learning to believe forward in your kids and that whatever's going on in the moment that seems hard or maybe you wouldn't wish for them, but that God's using those things for in the future. Just like you knew that he was going to, you didn't know in the moment, but you know now he was going to need that strong personality, that um, big personality to be able to raise his kids. And, and, and I think that's an encouragement mm -hmm. to so many of us. And even as if your grandparents looking at some of the things in your grandkids and say, listen, I'm just going to believe forward that God's using this, these personalities, all the things that there's going to be something on the other side as we may or may not see this side of, of heaven, but it's really, it's a sweet little opportunity to, to love and accept our kiddos where they yes. are. And, yeah. and so I think about this with, um, with just how much work you've done with preschoolers over the years. You've done it BSF. I know you've taught at Park City's Baptist preschoolers for so long um, because I know it from my own kids. Tell us, I guess, actually, how long has it been that you do th you've been doing this and, and what's your heart behind it? What keeps you going? Um, I tell you what, God was so gracious. And I remember when I was little, I loved babies. Mm. I remember being so drawn to those babies. And as I grew up, I never considered being a teacher. Mm. I was more in the business field and God took that and said, no, here's, here's where I want you to be. And so, you know, my first experience with children was right here when our kids, well, we only had our first one and I asked Nell Fuller about teaching VBS. And I got to teach four and five year olds with somebody who knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I had such a great love for children. And then that just led into, I couldn't wait to have my own children. And all of that just led into uh, BSF and teaching preschoolers there. When we were at um, a mission church, Park Cities, um, Val not Park Cities, Valley Ranch Baptist Church that was a mission of Park Cities, um, you had to serve. You had to do the work mm -hmm. or it wasn't going to get done. And so to be able to teach children there <coughs> on that level, and uh, we taught fourth and fifth graders forever in Sunday school. We love fourth and fifth graders. But when we came back here to Park Cities, uh, my joke is that my husband was teaching adults and I didn't want to have to listen to him. <laughs> so I decided to teach two-year-olds. And actually, I teach two-year-olds because I think there's quite often a misconception that it's child care. Right. And it's not, oh, the joy of teaching them the simplest truths from God's mm -hmm. Word and repeating that every single week. Yeah. It's so simple. It's not, uh, it's not rocket science in how, what I do. And I love these little hearts that are being transformed. Just simply, um, I heard about one little boy who was spending the night with his grandmother. And he was upstairs and she had the little speaker where she could hear him. And she said at about 5 a.m., she could hear him saying something that we do. We say absolutely true, yeah. absolutely true. Everything the Bible says is absolutely true. Yes. She could hear him on this little speaker. These truths that these children are hearing just make such a difference yeah. to me. And, and real life story <laughs> is, you've been saying that, the absolutely true, that whole, that whole, I guess it's not a rhyme, but the way you say that to them and kind of imprint that in their hearts. My kids still say it, like not in kind of almost a joking way. They'll say, everything in the Bible is absolute truth. And so it sticks with them. It matters, these things that we do at such a young age. I mean, they remember them. And, and so as you are around so many little ones and you teach, whether that's through BSF or through church, what are you seeing that the families today are facing? What are the things that you see that parents are struggling with that maybe you didn't struggle with in raising your kids? Oh, Cynthia, my heart hurts in one way for these children who only have the technology, who, who know nothing more than technology, who yeah. know nothing more than a world where, you know, we think we can come and speak to people the, in a way that we never would have before. Mm -hmm. uh, my family that moved to the Northeast, my grandson was in kindergarten 
at the time, and he came in, and you have to laugh, but you also have to realize the seriousness of this. He came home one day, and he said, Mom, do we, do we still celebrate Easter? Because he was in a different environment where, you know, he wasn't in the Bible Belt. No. And, at, you know, at that point, I realized that these children so early need to take ownership of their faith. It's not my faith. It's not your faith. These children need to know what they believe yeah. so that they can defend their faith, so that they can stand firm in what they know. Mm -hmm. And that never hit home so much as when I heard that statement from Jack. And if, I, if I'm sad over the fact of what they're having to grow up in, I have to come back and look to what God he planned these lives. Yeah. He planned these lives for this time. Mm -hmm. He planned these lives to be strong men and women of the Lord when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So I can't fret over my grandchildren and, oh, look what they're having to live with. God has a plan for them. Yeah. They are His. They are not mine. They are not their parents. They are His first. Mm -hmm. And He has a plan for them to rise up um, just as we've seen people in the Bible, you know, Abraham, all of these amazing people in the Bible. Mm. I like that whole idea of rise up. And, um, you know, I just think about from the time of Adam and Eve all the way until the second coming. At any point in this whole span of time, God created, could have created us, our kids, our mm -hmm. grandkids mm -hmm. to be on earth. And he's chosen now. And if he's chosen now, then we've got to believe he has them there so they can rise up, so that they can share the Great Commission, the gospel, and that he'll do that through them. And it may not look the way it's looked in our lives or my parents' lives. Um, it may not be the most traditional way that everything's worked through, you know, whether that's w, WMU or all the traditional programming exactly. we've done. Exactly. But the, the, we're rising at this next generation of the church. And as a church family, when we come together and start at the youngest of ages and serve and love these kids well, what a difference, what a difference that can make. And so it makes me think of something I, I guess I've learned, and again, I'm still raising kids, but I think about this all the time that I look back as I just sent one to college, and I look back and all the things in life that I thought were the big things, the big vacations or these big moments I thought were the big things were actually not the big things, and all the small things are actually kind of the big things, yeah. those small yeah. moments. And I just wonder, looking back, what, what would you tell younger Amy, what would, what would you say to yourself about, these are the things that matter, this is what's significant. What would you share with your kids and that, that matters? Um, I, I think I was a bit of a dictatorial parent. I think I'm being very <laughs> transparent here on uh, my parenting or lack thereof. Yeah. But I think to keep the main thing the main thing, yeah. which is the Lord Jesus. The, it's, I, I remember taking my youngest when he was in his little car seat down to volunteer where our church had a class that I was the room mom of. Um, I remember serving down at Cornerstone, mm. serving food to the, you know, those are the main things. Yeah. And it's not up to uh, my children or my grandchildren to please me. I've learned that it's a heart change. Yeah. It's a heart change for all of us um, when we become Christians, but it's a heart change for them mm -hmm. to, to please the Lord, not just on the outside and, oh, if I do this and if I check off all my little things, but within your heart to, to do something because it pleases the Lord, mm -hmm. not because it pleases my mom. Yeah, yeah. I love that idea. I think that would be a big change. Keeping the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of small things, I just have to ask, a favorite tradition that you've done with your family that you still keep up or that, that your kids would laugh about? Maybe they didn't love, but you loved? Um, I am a traditionalist in our, oh, in Christmas and all of those other things. And yet my children are not. <laughs> we would go to my mom and dad's house. We would have Christmas Eve. We knew the menu. We yep. would have Christmas morning. And my sister had it where we switched, so we were all together. And I loved it. Well, my children have not taken that so much. I mean, they love being together, and they are, my children are best friends. 
Yeah. And what more can I ask from that? But with one living out of state and the other two having a lot going on in mm -hmm. their lives, that's not happening. Yeah. And that was a big learning curve for me mm -hmm. that um, it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. It has to be okay. And what a gift to your children to be able to say in some of those places where we want it to look a certain way or we have expectations to let those go and, and let our kids do it their way. I know my parents are really good at that, at the things that maybe would be a big deal to them. And they realize like that's just not as big, of, that's not the hill to die on with us. And so we just do it differently now and how sweet that is to have flexibility. So I've been thinking, I was reading um, in my quiet time last week, I was reading that whole story about when the Israelites were in the battle and Moses, every time he would lift his hands, they were winning. And when he put him down, they were losing. And up and down, and finally his arms got so tired, right? And right. so uh, right. there we have Aaron and her, and they sit him on a stool or on a rock, and they hold up his arms for him, right? And this verse caught me that I've never noticed. It's in Exodus 17, 12. And it said, his hands remain steady until sunset. Mm. And I was like, that's beautiful. Mm. If, we, if that could be our testimony, that our hands remain steady until sunset, because there's just so many opportunities for this world, for all that's going on around us to shake us. And I'm just wondering, with you and your community, what's, what's this Park Cities Baptist meant to you and Lloyd and your family and your Christian community, even outside of the church and BSF, how has that helped keep your hands steady? I think when you try to go off the beaten path and do it yourself, which is, uh, you know, I'm a doer, let me, and I'm a fixer. Let me go fix this. Yeah. But so often that's not what I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I thought about even when Jeff preaches, he preaches on how to reach out and how to be more mm -hmm. than, you know, it's not about me. What's the book that was written, Rick Warren? Yeah. It's not about me. And it should never be about me. And so I'm so undergirded by, um, by our pastor, by a community. When I see these moms that are raising up these children with such great uh, love for the Lord. Um, one thing I brought, and it's humorous that you're going to be talking to him today, but this book, it said it's, it's praying circles around your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But why not just put in grand? I mean, you can pray yeah. circles around your children, which I love to do. You can pray circles undergirding your grandchildren in prayer mm. is mm. huge. Yeah. It's huge. And so if your heart is not where it needs to be, where you're being an example to them mm -hmm. when you're with them and yet undergirding them in prayer, then you've, you've kind of missed the point, I think. And one thing, I, one other thing I brought that um, I actually got from BSF, I want to give them credit, is these are 20 things that you can pray for your children. Mm. And I love how specific they are and how they are not teeny. You know, they're big things that they will know Christ as Savior early in life, mm -hmm. that they will have a hatred for sin. Mm these different things that they will learn to totally submit to God and actively resist Satan in all circumstances. You know, we're not here to pray. You want them to have good friends, but we're not here to pray. Oh, let them have a good day. You know, we're here to undergird them with the, the armor of God yeah. and to raise, help be a part of raising them up for this next generation yeah. for the world we live in. And I love this idea of praying for your kids and your grandkids, but also articulating to them that that's what you're doing. And I know you do that well. My parents have done that well. My kids, even my one at college, will text my mom and say, pray for me today. I have this or that. And just she's mm. known that she's been prayed over mm -hmm. her whole life. I know I've been prayed over my whole life. And the beauty of it is it's never too late. So someone's listening exactly. to this. Someone's listening to this and is like, oh, gosh, I wish I would have done something differently or in parenting or maybe it didn't look how I thought it was going to look with my kids. And, and here's a hearty amen for all of us. I think we all feel that in so many ways that maybe we got it wrong or we missed the mark. But the beauty of it is there's, there's ways that um, you're just, you never retire to still be involved, praying over your kids, praying over your grandkids, taking those small moments, car rides, after the game, the sporting event, just showing up is so critical. Loving them well, loving them where they are. I just feel like 
those are just places um, that we can do that. Well, and also, you know, something they have now that we, t speaking of technology that quite often I don't like, I can text my grandkids. Yeah. And we can be on, a, I think there's a group text of mm -hmm. pop, pop, ya, ya, and then the ones who are able to text. And I love maintaining that connection with them. Yeah. And being able to communicate with them in that way. Wow. You know, in the, in the story we are just talking about um, with Moses, at the end, after they won the battle, after he had had his arms held up and the Israelites won the battle, he built an altar, which I always love this idea of building altars in the places where you've just visibly mm. seen God's successes. But he built an altar and it said in Exodus 17, 15, he built it, he said, the Lord is my banner. And so I looked up like, what does he mean exactly banner? And so a banner was a rallying point. It might be for us a flag or something that unifies the people, the troops, and, mm -hmm. and maybe if, if, if the troops get off base and they're kind of spread out, they come back to the banner. That's how you meet up again. And, and I love that Moses is saying like, listen, our rallying point, our banner is the Lord. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I think today, Amy, in today's culture, you know this as well, if not better than I do, when we're in this divisive culture where we're divided politically, racially, economically, every level we're divided, if we could just come back and say, the Lord is my banner. End of discussion. Yes. I think you've mm -hmm. done that so well. Mm -hmm. I've seen it just through your family and the example you've set, but also through so many kids, through my family. And so I'm just so grateful for that. And that's my encouragement as, as we leave today is just encourage people. The Lord is our banner. And so in all the places where it's easy to get caught up in the things that are not the main things or to give up or throw our hands up or think, oh, this next generation will never make it or be caught up in, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I don't know how you believe. I don't know how you, or how you vote. I don't know how you do your finances. I don't know a lot of things, but I know that your banner is the Lord. And I'm just so grateful yes. for that. And may that be a testimony for all of us. Oh, so thank you, Cynthia. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And thank I you, everyone. It. And we sure love Amy Weedy. And you can find her on any given Sunday morning with the two-year-olds. My two-year-olds that two -year -olds. I love so much. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you.